All right, so I have 50 slides in 10 minutes, so let's go. I have Generative AI, ChatGPT, Web3, so all the right buzzwords, and we're gonna be talking about some ambitious ideas at the intersection of these two areas, but, but from a very pragmatic standpoint, like uh, a little bit about my background that we don't have time to cover. I'm the CEO of Into the Block, like we're known as a market intelligence provider. We use a lot of machine learning and AI to provide intelligence about the, mar the crypto market, but we also trade that we build a lot of quantitative strategies for DeFi, and it's probably the area that, that has ruined the growth of the company. Also the co-founder of a generative AI company, venture back called Factory, uh, write an AI newsletter, teach Apply AI at Columbia, and a bunch of other stuff. So what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna give you a brief history of generative AI and what is called foundation models. All these things that you're hearing, ChatGPT, GPT-4, where did they come from? Then let's talk at the intersection of Web3 and foundation models, what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the challenges, right, for Web3 to embrace this paradigm? And then at the very end, I wanna run two moonshot ideas by you, ideas that I believe somebody should be building in this market. So we have been hearing a lot about ChatGPT, GPT-4, all these things, where, uh, where do they come from? So the paradigm that in the AI industry that we know these models is as foundation models. So foundation model is different from traditional machine learning in which we used to train models with label data, like an image classification algorithm in which we will say this is a cat, this is a dog, etc. Now these models we train it with unlabeled data, a lot of unlabeled images, Wikipedia and things like that. And what happened is they started exhibiting emerging properties right, that we didn't plan for it. They were able to generate emails and they were able to, to generate images from text and things like that. And then there is this process called fine tuning that you can actually optimize a model for a specific domain. This all started in 2016 with a paper from Google called Attention is All You Need in which it, it um, promoted, it outlined this architecture called the transformer model that is what has changed everything. It's a combination of two components, encoder, decoder, but the one thing that you need to know about this, essentially transformers were very good processing large sequence of data and identifying which areas they needed to pay attention to, which was very good for in text, predicting the next word of a text. With all these models, chat GPT, GPT-4, that's what they're good at. Then after, um, after the BERT uh, paper, there was an explosion of models. So Microsoft started working on stuff, Google started working on stuff, DeepMind and others, and uh, eventually GPT-3 became sort of the default, like the most successful model in the space, but it was not mainstream. Like people were not going crazy about GPT-3. So what really changed between GPT-3 and ChatGPT? This is something that not many people talked about. It will surprise you that the research that caused all that is from 2017. It's not something new. It's a thing called reinforcement learning with human preference, with human feedback. So RLHF, you're gonna hear that a lot in, in ML theory for this thing. So reinforcement learning is this theory that became very popular uh, because it was used for AlphaGo to beat Lissidol, the, the Go world champion, but it was only used on gaming on things like that. So OpenAI figured out that they could actually take the outputs of a, of a language model and provide a trial and error reinforcement learning feedback and you will start getting outputs that were aligned with human preferences. So GPT-3 plus RLHF created this thing called InstructGPT and InstructGPT was a version of GPT-3 that was good at following instructions. So you could tell, write an email about marketing with this and it will understand, right? With the GPT-3 didn't know how to do that. It knew how to answer questions or do some basic stuff. And then InstructGPT plus GPT-3 is ChatGPT. That's, what, that's what, you're, uh, what you're seeing today with ChatGPT. Now, transformers were all about language. While that was happening, in computer vision, we had a different movement called diffusion models. And diffusion models were this technique that essentially deconstruct an image and reconstruct it back in a multidimensional space, and it learned how to generate image. But it turns out, that it, if you represent text in a multi-dimensional space, an image in that same dimensional space, the concepts are very close. So the word dog and an image of a dog in 10,000 dimensions, they look similar. So 
we saw an explosion of models that were able to generate text, for image from text. And there you have DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion was important here because then it shows that these things can be uh, open source. And it, it was the first open source release at a scale. And then what happened is that these models started getting good at other things like coding, like mathematics, and solving complex math uh, problems. And now that cause what is called multi-model generative AI, which the maximum expression is GPT-4. So GPT-4 can do image, can do coding, can do math problems, can do reasoning, and obviously can do language. And then you're seeing a lot of alternatives. So there is a big competitor of OpenAI called Anthropic that released this thing called Cloud. There is Cohere. Google is working on Bar. Uh, Facebook accidentally open sources this thing called Llama. And, and there is a lot of open source initiative. So the most important thing here is uh, generative AI is by far the most transformational movement, technology movement of several generations. I mean, Web3 is really, really, really not like that. But when you think about generative AI and Web3, what are the opportunities, right? I published a couple of articles on Coindesk about this. There are opportunities and challenges. Opportunities, there, there are many that are low-hanging fruit. So think about changing the wallet experience, right? Wallets today are a very point-and-clicky thing. Can we do conversations? Can we talk? to a wallet asking questions about a transaction and placing transactions. How about explorers, right? Explorer is such an int integral component of the Web3 ecosystem. It's, it's our Google, right? It's our entry point. Can we, can we have conversations with Explorer and ask, like, how is the, la la the last hour in Uniswap? What are whales doing in Curve? Uh, and things like that. A smart contract co-pilot, so writing a smart contract code is very complex. Can we have a co-pilot assistance, a GitHub co-pilot for, uh, for Solidity and Trust and others? And also intelligent NFTs. NFTs are, uh, are like glorified JPEGs. Can we have NFTs that tell us about the inspiration of the artists that react to your emotions? Things like that. There are also challenges. So I published this con uh, controversial piece in, in Coindesk in which that essentially said that generative AI might be bad for Web3. Why? Well, for a decade, we never bothered to build a machine learning foundation in Web3. And now what's happening is all that innovation is happening in Web2. And Web3 is really not, not participating. Among other things, because running these models in distributed uh, in blockchain runtimes is very costly, and we don't have blockchain runtimes optimized. And also, a lot of BC and engineering talent is going over there because it's a hottest trend, and Web3 is suffering. So it's not very trivial. But then I want to leave you with two ambitious ideas. And these are things that somebody should build or think about building. So in the initial phase, Web3 could be a consumer of generative AI, like building conversational explorers, wallets, and things like that. But what if we build a blockchain for generative AI? I think this use case exists today. And here's why. So there is enough open source innovation today in generative AI that is creating a lot of concerns because this, these models could be weaponized. So there is enough value on putting constraints around this via smart contracts, publishing the weights of the models, how the model was trained, proof of knowledge, proof of you know, non-bias, not racist, not harmful comment. And there is, an, there, there is value on these things that blockchains could solve. And also, Web3 has to be a participant in this economy, or generative AI is not going to be only Web2. We need to bring that to Web3, and I believe it has to be a new blockchain, and I believe it has to be either a zero knowledge layer two or something in the Cosmos uh, ecosystem. And then this other, uh, uh oh OK, I can talk about it. So um, let's see. This other idea is what I call block GPT. What if we have a model, a GPT model, that is trained in all blockchain knowledge, all Discord channels, all Twitter threads, all news, everything, all white papers, everything that has happened in the Web3 ecosystem since the beginning. And you can ask questions like, hey, is this uh, activity during the Euler hack, how does that correspond to the tokenomics of the protocol and things like that. It understands the paper, understands the blockchain transactions, and it can give you information, understands. So it's not parsing data, it's not giving a trivial answers, it's actually understanding the intricacies of what a blockchain transaction is, how it correlates with a white paper, and, um, and things like that. So what we can be sure 
is that if this doesn't happen, the gap between generative AI is going to create a massive gap between Web 2 and Web 3 because this doesn't evolve linearly. This evolves multi-exponentially. So the, the, the minute these models achieve certain level of generalization, they become so much better. That is really hard to bridge a gap. So this has to be done. And, and I believe that a new generation of Web 3 platforms are going to merge with generative AI as a core component. So summarizing this, so generative AI is the most transformational uh, technology movement of several generations. Cloud was not like that, Web3 was not like that. This is going to change everything, it's changing everything. So there is, there is plenty of use cases today that could be adapted from Web3 to generative AI, conversational wallets, explorers, and things like that. Eventually, I think we need to bring generative AI to native Web3 ecosystem. So it has to be a native component. And before, six months ago, there were no open source models that we could use. Now we have a stability, a stable diffusion. We have Llama, we have Alpaca, Bikina. There is a ton of models that could be adapted to Web3, and you don't need to rely on open AI or the commercial uh, models. So Web3 has definitely fallen behind in that case, and there is plenty of ambitious use cases. That's all I have. That was 40 slides in 10 minutes. So that's my contact info. And with that, uh, we can go to questions, I guess. Do we? No questions? No questions? Well, no questions. OK, well, thank you very much. No.